why does Blender need so many good dumb add-ons? Today, there are over 500,000 add-ons on Blender Market alone, and more than 400 official extensions on Blender's own site. So why does Blender need that many damn add-ons? To answer this question, we have to go back to a time when the Blender Market didn't exist. There were no official Blender extensions, and add-ons weren't even a thing. To revisit that era, we need to rewind to 2010, nearly 15 years ago, just before the release of Blender 2.5. Back then, Blender looked completely different. The user interface was, well, let's just say it wasn't winning any design awards. There were no plugins or add-ons like we have today. Around this time, Andrew Price, also known as Blender Guru, released a video series called Improving Blender. In it, he pointed out just how unintuitive and clunky Blender's UI was. These videos sparked serious debate across the community and caused enough of a stir to reach Blender's founder, Tan Rusendahl. Tan responded publicly in a blog post titled Redefining Blender, addressing many of the issues raised. These community discussions, while sometimes heated, helped shape the Blender we know today. They kicked off a chain reaction of slow but steady improvements. One of the biggest shifts was Blender's transition toward a more modular design. This was crucial because it meant Blender could be extended and customized without overloading the core software. And that's where add-ons come in. As Blender evolved, the core team focused on keeping the main application lightweight and flexible. Instead of cramming every feature imaginable into the base install, they created hooks and systems that allowed developers to build tools on top of Blender. One of the earliest and most impactful examples of this was Cycles, Blender's now default ray trace based render engine. Before Cycles, we had Blender Internal, which by today's standards was painfully limited. It wasn't physically based, had no mesh lighting, couldn't simulate proper refractions or caustics, and relied heavily on manual light setups and baking tricks to get anything close to realism. Complex lighting setups were difficult to manage, materials lacked realism, and things like glossy reflections or accurate transparency were a nightmare to pull off. When Cycles was first introduced, it wasn't baked into Blender like it is now. It was, was developed as a separate render engine, bundled with Blender as a Python add-on. Users had to manually enable it in the preferences under the render category. This approach was intentional. It let the developers work on cycles as a work-in-progress tool without forcing it into the main interface before it was fully ready. Meanwhile, artists could test it, give feedback, and use it in production if they were brave enough. It was a smart way to introduce a major feature without breaking existing workflows or making Blender feel unstable. Blender's strength isn't just in what it can do out of the box, it's in how easy it is to expand. That's why there are so many add-ons. Not because Blender is weak without them, but because it's strong enough to let people build on top of it. The add-on problem is really a sign of a thriving ecosystem, full of passionate developers and artists pushing Blender into new territory every day. In the early days, most add-ons were actually developed and maintained by the Blender Foundation itself. These were simple tools, but incredibly useful. Things like the landscape add-on, the Archimesh and Archipack architectural tools, loop tools for modeling enhancements, and a few rigging utilities. They laid the groundwork for what add-ons could be, extending Blender's core without bloating the software. Soon after, the broader community started to get involved. Some of the early community contributions were actually just asset packs. YouTubers like Blender Guru included assets in his uh, Nature Academy course around 2011, and others like CG Matters followed with their own Nature Asset Packs. These weren't code-heavy tools, but they added real value for artists by speeding up workflow and improving scene quality. As time went on, add-ons became more sophisticated, and developers began creating full-featured tools. Things really started to peak with the release of Blender 2.8 and the introduction of Eevee, Blender's real-time render engine. This was a major turning point. Blender was at the peak of its hype, attracting a wave of new users from other DCCs like Maya, 3ds Max, and Cinema 4D. These artists were used to certain workflows and toolsets that Blender didn't have out of the box. Rather than giving up on Blender, many of these experienced users decided to build the tools they were missing themselves. That shift dramatically expanded the scope and quality of add-ons, and it's one of the reasons Blender's add-on ecosystem exploded the way it did. This decision gave birth to the massive add-on ecosystem we see today, and with that explosion came some truly game-changing tools. Notable add-ons like HardOps and BoxCutter completely redefined hard surface modeling workflows. 
Flip Fluids brought high-quality liquid simulation to Blender long before the built-in systems could keep up. Animation nodes and later geometry nodes gave artists full control over procedural animation and effects. AutoRig Pro made rigging characters far less painful, while Gaffer helped streamline lighting setups. Other community favorites include Decal Machine for surface detailing, Botanic for vegetation, photorealistic grass and ground scatter. These add-ons, among hundreds of others, didn't just add functionality, they helped raise Blender's production value to a level that could compete with industry giants. Some have even become essential tools in many professional pipelines, whether you're making games, architectural renders, movies, VFX, simulations, or just messing around with abstract geometry, there's probably an add-on or 10 to help you do it better, faster, or with way less frustration. This explosion of add-ons, combined with Blender proving itself as a capable, free, and open-source alternative to industry titans, attracted a ton of talent. Game developers, indie filmmakers, animators from all genres, and more began flooding in. Blender was rocketing to the top of the DCC pyramid, but it didn't yet have all the functionality and tools that professionals coming from Maya or Cinema 4D were used to. The Blender development team suddenly had their hands full. They were juggling new feature requests, bug reports coming in by the thousands, and a growing user base that had higher expectations than ever. So a gap had to be filled by the Blender community itself. This demand could be roughly split into two major categories, the need for tools and functionality, and the need for assets, presets, and models. Other DCCs like Cinema 4D and 3ds Max shipped with massive built-in material libraries and presets. Blender came with basically nothing. You had to build everything from scratch. So two kinds of add-on creators emerged, tool makers, like the developers of HardOps, and asset providers, like Botanic. With these categories defined, the race was on to meet the growing demand. All that was missing was a better way to connect creators with users. Before Blender Market, now called Superhive, there was Gumroad. But Gumroad wasn't focused on Blender, so Blender tools had to compete with all kinds of unrelated content for visibility. Then Blender Market came online and everything changed. Now the hundreds of creators who had the skills to build great tools had a dedicated space and a hungry audience. To complete the equation, a fourth piece entered the scene, add-on affiliates. These were YouTubers, bloggers, and social media influencers who promoted add-ons in exchange for a commission. Every year, Blender attracts thousands, if not millions, of new users. That's a fresh wave of potential add-on buyers. And that's why it's nearly impossible to go on YouTube without seeing videos about the latest Blender add-ons. I'm guilty of making these videos myself, but honestly, it's exciting. Talking about new tools, or even old ones, knowing someone out there is discovering it for the first time, that never gets old. And these videos wouldn't be so popular if the demand wasn't real. Today, this has created a beautiful ecosystem where the Blender developers aren't pressured to rush every new feature. The add-on community has that covered, giving the core team the space to focus on polishing and strengthening Blender's foundations. At the same time, Blender artists no longer need to constantly jump between programs just to get something done. If Blender doesn't have a tool out of the box, chances are someone has built it as an add-on. So if you're looking for something, you can probably find it. And if you're curious, check the description. I've included my own affiliated add-ons ranging from VFX tools, RBD systems, geometry nodes generators, and more. You get what you need, and I get to keep the lights on. Thanks for watching, and I hope that answers the question, why does Blender need so many gud dumb add-ons? It's simple. Add-ons keep everyone's hands free. The artists can make more art, and the Blender team can keep making Blender better without having to sacrifice stability for features.